right? And to say that they have no power, they're oppressed when they can actually leverage that kind of power, right? And then, I mean, it's gaslighting on a massive scale. Has JK Rowling committed a cardinal sin by first tweeting to her followers that erasing the concept of sex will remove the ability of many people to meaningfully discuss their lives and then doubling down on her stance in both Twitter replies and in an essay published on her own website. Judging by the tone of media coverage and by the backlash from all corners of liberal elite, one would have thought so. However, many believe that issue lies just beneath the surface and that is freedom of speech. Is our freedom of speech being impeded by aggressive left-wing activists? We've sat down with Karen Strong, who is a well-known men's rights activist, to discuss the future of activism and freedom of speech. Talking about upsetting people, hmm. it does seem that J.K. Rowling has upset quite a few people now. Or uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure why. I mean, here's the thing: like, I'm I'm very trans friendly. I have many trans friends who. I'm on hugging terms with when I run into them at events and stuff, right? I mean, like wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, so I'm, I'm not, but I don't disagree with JK Rowling, right? That you can't just say biological sex is not a thing or that it doesn't matter. Her statements were pretty innocuous. She, she said, you know, be who you are, embrace the person you are inside and express yourself however you like, live your best life, love the people who will love you back, right? Do all of that, that's great, but biological sex is a thing and it matters. And, uh, and for that, she's essentially uh, being canceled. So I, I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking, this is, uh, this is, this is not okay. Uh, so, but I mean, like you, you're looking at it, we, we've got one part of society that's essentially uh, taking crazy pills and the rest of us are wondering am i crazy like that i think that this is out of control um so yeah so and so yeah what will happen with likes of um um jk rowling again um because it's as she said in her what did she say in her post it would be so much easier to tweet the approved hashtags because of course Trans rights are human rights, and of course, trans lives matter. Scoop up the woke cookies and bask in a virtue signaling afterglow. The, the funny thing is, is that these trans activists will tell you that trans people have no power, and yet they can cancel one of the most successful women on the, and most beloved women on the face of the planet. You know, like all of those Harry Potter fans, right, are now excoriating her. All of the Harry Potter actors who got rich off of her work right excoriating her right and that means that the trans community you know taken as a whole or as I guess the the set of ideas and activists that claim to represent the trans community because they don't represent every trans person's opinions but they're claiming that they have no power and yet they can cancel this woman right they can they can get Twitter right who, which is supposed to be you know, a bastion of free speech and free exchange of ideas to forbid certain ideas from being spoken on their platform, right? And to say that they have no power, they're oppressed when they can actually leverage that kind of power, right? And then, I mean, it's gaslighting on a massive scale. So where all this uh, leaves freedom of speech, basically? Oh, well, if you, if you misgender or dead name someone on Twitter, you can be banned for that, right? Uh, you'll, you'll get a suspension and a warning, temporary suspension and a warning, and be ordered to delete the tweet. If you refuse to delete the tweet, uh, your, your suspension is indefinite. Um, but right now, what you're seeing is, you know, that the, the discourse is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And then on top of that, you have social media, which is encouraging the construction of echo, echo chambers, right? So you've got the mute button and you've got the block button and you can, you can essentially, and then you've got block bots that, that will not just, you know, if you block one person, then you block all of their followers and everybody who's, and you can choose the number of tiers, right? You know, 
uh, the, the six degrees of separation of, you know, of Kevin Bacon um, and end up blocking nearly everyone on Twitter with the click of one button. But uh, anyone who might have an opinion that you, that makes you uncomfortable. And uh, so I think that that has a lot to do with what's going on. But we also have this situation where a lot of these ideas uh, and I call them ideas or sometimes conjectures, and that's everything from uh, feminist uh, theory. Uh, I call it feminist conjecture. It's, it does not rise even to the level of a hypothesis. It's, they've never tried to falsify it. They've never really proved any of their, their grand claims, um, but they have this grand unifying theory called, you know, of the patriarchy. And, uh, and then they have all these little bastard offshoots of sub theories that they think proves it and you look at their data and it's just uh, so shaky that you, just, you wouldn't even believe it. And uh, then you have, uh, you know, sort of social justice grievance studies. So black studies and, um, and uh, anything pretty much ending with the word studies, right, is going to be teaching uh, everything through a lens uh, called uh, class conflict theory which is uh, Marxist, in or Marxist in origin, there are a whole bunch of ways uh, in lenses through which you can examine how society works and how people interact in society. So you got, you know, utilitarianism and materialism and all kinds of, you know, uh, you got different ways. Uh, a lot of evolutionary psychologists say there are three basic types of relationships. You've got your dominance relationships, you've got your kinship relationships, and then uh, humans have expanded that to friendships. Um, and then you have your, your uh, uh, tit for tat. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kinds of relationships, which would come into, you know, trade and business and uh, just interacting with your pizza delivery guy. And, you know, he gives, brings you a pizza, you give him a tip and, you know, it's very polite, right? And uh, so, I mean, like you have all these ways of examining society um but these grievance studies uh, or activist disciplines uh they look at it through only one lens and the mark the marxist lens is not necessarily worthless um it does explain some things on a superficial level but it does not explain the entire picture right so they're essentially pushing all of these other lenses out the door and they're focusing on one lens, which is uh, if there are two people in an interaction, one is an oppressor and the other is oppressed, right? And that's, that's how all human interaction and how all society can be described and defined is through this class conflict or class struggle model and of exploitation and, uh, and uh, privilege, right? So you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, and then, then, like I said, these are activist disciplines, right? So that means that activism is actually mandatory. Student activism, you know, you'll have an assignment uh, throughout the course, go out and organize some activist something in your community, right? Engage in activism. So you had all, and this has been happening for about 60 years. It's been since about the mid 60s, early 70s in our universities. So you have all of these people who are kind of brought into a very narrowly focused way of defining the world and other people around them. And they are told that they must be politically active and they must agitate for change, right? And then when they get out of university, right, they're super excited, they're super pumped and they wanna proselytize, so where do they go? They go into journalism and they go into politics and they go into social work and they go into education and they go into uh, um, the law, right? And they go into uh, NGOs and they, they go into all of these areas where they can actually change things in the ways that they want and convince more people to join them. So what we're seeing right now, I think with all of the protests and the riots and everything across the US and spilling over into your country and the tearing down of statues and it, Winston Churchill, what the hell? Um, 
you know, and all of these things going on and then the trans activism and, and, you know, people getting banned for uh, calling Caitlyn Jenner Bruce on Twitter and all of these things, right? It's all the culmination of uh, showing that, you know, what started off in those universities ha is now, it spread its tentacles or its tendrils uh, into enough institutions uh, and changed the way HR departments are notorious yeah. for being stuffed full of people who think this way. And, uh, and everybody else just has to get on the bandwagon. And because it's a class struggle, because there is this, you know, our entire, the entire system is a system of white supremacy or male supremacy or whatever. Um, your silence is actually complicity. So you can't stay neutral. You're not allowed to stay neutral. You must not just voice your support, but fund our movement, fund our, our, I guess, our cause, our tactics, approve of our tactics, right? So it's not enough to say, well, peaceful protests are great, um, but probably you shouldn't be burning things down. Um, that's, not, that's not good. No, no, you're not allowed to say that now. Uh, if you're if you're someone on the left, you are a former leftist in good standing, and you say, if you dare to say, well, we shouldn't be burning Target, the local Target down. That's where all the black people around here shop, right? That's where they get, they get that's where they get their food, right? Um, you're not allowed to say that. It, you excommunicated. Gone. So in in all those movements, uh, feminist movements, LGBTQ, the there are people with genuine grievances who were potentially at one point in their life mistreated or misunderstood. Um, how do they, how can they make their voice heard without being associated with this left wing, very aggressive activism? How to well, draw think, the line? I think the first thing you can do is you can avoid the words privilege and oppression. Um, just avoid those words, say, here's an issue. Um, avoid the word systemic. Um, you know, here's an issue. Here's an issue with the law. Um, here's an issue with uh, police training. Here's an issue with, you know, and that we can actually work on that and change that. Uh, avoid demonizing. I mean, this is one of the things that, that's going on since uh, George, Flo George Floyd's death is that, you know, this sort of really radical push for change defund the entire police system like just abolish the police and uh like yeah that's gonna work out great um we already have all of this lawlessness going on um i guess in chicago uh and new york city uh violent crime is and homicide is up since george floyd died has been up something like between 250 and 300 percent, right? So because the police are pulling back because they feel vilified, and uh, but you just you know common sense solutions. Here's how we can tweak the law to do to take care of this one thing, and here's how we can raise awareness of this particular thing. Um, there are so many issues that are actually caused by changes to the law that that happened uh, that came about to fix some other thing right so you know you had deadbeat dads who who abandoned their families and so in the 1980s or maybe it was late 70s they brought in something in the united states called title 4d which was a child support collection uh act and they essentially said that okay states for state child support agencies for every dollar of child support they collect they will get a dollar in federal grant money. So there's a huge financial incentive to collect child support, but that also means there's a huge financial incentive to, uh, for courts and states to resist legislating shared parenting um, because child support is not just based on income, it's based on how much time you spend with the child. And so if you spend 60% of your time with, uh, or 40% of your time with the child or the child spends 40% of their time with you, you pay less than if the child only spends 8% of the time with you. So it incentivizes pushing men out of their children's lives and it incentivizes uh, aggressively um, pursuing child support even when men can't afford it because they've lost their jobs or they've you know, had some 
a medical emergency or something that that they got a big bill from it. It also made child support um, un, you're unable to expunge it in a bankruptcy. So you can go bankrupt, completely go bankrupt, but that child support debt, that's just like student debt, that's sitting there. It's it'll follow you for the rest of your life. So this is sort of what you know, we tried to fix one problem and then we created another problem. So um, I think that, uh, but pointing out those problems is is a good thing to do, but couching it in some kind of uh, narrative of, you know, this group in its entirety, entirety is privileged and this group in its entirety is oppressed. And, you know, and th these things are like super systemic and, and all like it's, it just it's going to put people off if you want to, if you want to sound like a sensible person don't talk like a social justice warrior just talk about the problem well thank you so much for sticking with us until the end of this video as always your constructive comments are very much appreciated so do leave your comments in a section down below we hope you like our new series of interviews aptly titled break your bubble and we've got more where that came from so don't forget to hit that subscribe button and a bell if you want to be notified of all our future uploads.